Hello and welcome back to our third notes in the serology unit. Today we're going to talk about blood spatter. Yes, it is spatter. It is not splatter. There's no L. So blood spatter. Now, as a forensic scientist, we can learn a lot of information about a crime just from the blood that is left behind. We don't need a video or eyewitnesses or even a body necessarily just from the blood patterns we can learn a lot and so I'm going to give you a, a list of a bunch of things that we can figure out if we have the right kind of blood spatter. We can figure out how far away did that blood come from the target. When I say target I mean the, the victim that bled whether that was actually the victim or the assailant but the target who bled. We can figure out um, from which direction did that blood come. We can figure out how fast that blood left its source. So was it a punch or a kick or was it a baseball bat or a gunshot? We can figure out what, where the position of the victim and the assailant were based on the blood. We can also, if we have enough blood spatter and if the victim and assailant moved around, we can actually track that movement based on the blood and we can even determine how many blows or shots or incidents there were based on that blood. We can do all of that just from the blood spatter and that's what we're going to learn how to do uh, this week and the first part of next week. So the reason that blood behaves the way it does is because of three specific physical properties and I just we're not going to go over them uh, in depth but I want you to know what they are. They are viscosity which means how resistant to flow something is. Uh, water is not viscous. Honey is very viscous. So blood has a specific uh, viscosity. They always say blood is thicker than the water and that's true because there are cells in there. The next is specific gravity and that's just a comparison of the density of a substance to the density of water and again because blood is more viscous it has a higher specific gravity and finally we have surface tension and that is the resistance to penetration or separation uh, it's the reason why when you jump into a pool if you land awkwardly it hurts really bad because the water doesn't want to the surface tension of the water doesn't want to um, release its bonds from each other and so that comes into play with how blood uh, acts as well so those three specific physical properties make blood act the way that it does now let's talk about how blood drips we're going to start with the most basic dripping blood and then we'll work up to more and more and more complex when blood drips uh, obviously it trickles downward so we have a cut up here on this person's wrist and blood will trickle, trickle downward here's my fancy animation there he goes and obviously it's going to trickle downward because of gravity the blood drop is going to grow and grow and grow here grew with the bottom of their finger until the weight in grams of that blood is greater than the surface tension of blood and once that weight exceeds the surface tension a drop of blood will break free now it will start in a teardrop shape and that's because it's trying to hold on this trailing edge of the blood is actually trying to stay attached but because it weighs so much or it weighs more than the surface tension it eventually breaks free but it quickly corrects surface tension pulls in vertically first and then horizontally second so we finally settle into a sphere if blood is dripping of its own accord there's no extra movement there's no extra anything then blood drops will contain 0 0.05 milliliters of blood every single time so if we have a certain uh, radius of a blood drop that 0 0.05 milliliters makes then we know that it's just dripping blood and it doesn't break up until impact obviously now there are a couple factors that are going to affect the shape and the size of blood drops and the two when we're talking about dripping blood specifically the shape mostly depends on the surface target surface now once we start getting into movement then the angle of impact is going to play a much bigger role and we're going to discuss angle of impact in our activity this week uh, where I teach you how to determine that but if we're just talking, talking dropping blood dripping blood like you get a nosebleed and it's dripping or somebody gets cut and they're just 
dripping off their finger. That shape is mostly dependent on the texture of the surface it hits lands on. Mostly, is it rough or smooth? The uh, other thing is, is it porous or non-porous? Are we going to absorb the blood when it hits or not? If we were still at school, we would do a lab today where you drip blood, fake blood, on a bunch of different surfaces to see how it affects the shape. Sadly, we cannot do that lab. Um, the size of the blood drop, assuming it's just a drip, and again, every drip is going to have 0 0.05 mils of blood, then the, sh the size of it is mostly based on how far it falls. Because the farther it falls, the faster it goes. The faster it goes, the more it spreads out on contact. However, once you go beyond 1.2 meters, which is about four-ish feet or so, then that blood drop, because it's so small, hits its terminal velocity and can't go any faster. So a blood drop from five feet up versus a blood drop from 50 feet up, it's not going to go any faster and the blood drop's not going to get any bigger. So those are our two big factors, shape and size. Uh, that It's going to be texture and porousness and then how far it falls. Let me illustrate for you why texture matters so much with a couple pictures here. Um, that you can see that's a meter stick, so this guy's head is about 1.2 meters or so. Um, let me show you the effect of the target surface. So here we have a smooth target, and we're going to drop some blood on it. So here comes the blood. Boom. Now, if it's smooth, that blood drop is going to spread out, and the surface tension is not going to get disrupted, and so we're going to get a nice smooth round drop. If, however, our target surface is rough, and then the surface tension as, oh, there's some nice round drops for us. The surface tension as it spreads is going to get broken up by the irregular surface. And we're going to get what's called satellite spatter. Those satellite spatters are these ones that break off and are these extra things. We also get these little spikes on the ends as well. So you can tell whether or not the surface was um, very smooth or rough based on the type of blood spatter shape. Okay, the next thing we need to get into is velocities. Blood spatter is going to change based on how fast the blood is leaving the target. So we categorize that into three different velocities and super simple, low, medium, and high. So that's easy. So we're going to go over what those mean and how it changes the blood drops that we would find at a crime scene based on those velocities. Low velocity blood spatter is going slow. We're talking five feet per second or so or less. This is mostly just dripping blood. That blood 0 0.05 mils will turn into about a four to eight millimeter spot depending on how far it felt fell. And again, free falling drops we could get low velocity blood from, uh, so here's somebody walk down a hall bleeding and drop blood. That could be splashing in blood. And I don't mean like taking a bath in a tub of blood because you're a vampire, but I mean like, let's say somebody commits a crime and they are injuring multiple people and there's blood on the ground and then they run from the cops and they splash the blood that's already on the ground maybe. Um, we also could have arterial spurting. If you are unfortunate enough as a victim to get one of your arteries cut, then every time the heart pumps, it will actually spurt blood out. I know they show that on TV and it always looks fake, but actually um, that can be real. And uh, the last one is what we call cast off. This could be from a fist when somebody's punching or a shoe when they're kicking or a weapon. We're going to before we get on to medium velocity blood, I'm going to take a detour here and go over cast off. Here's an example of cast off from a weapon on the wall. And we can, we can actually learn a lot from this cast off. So let me show you what I mean by that. Cast off from a weapon happens not on the first blow usually. The first blow causes the bleeding, but it's the subsequent blows that get the weapon. Or it could be your hand or your fist uh, contaminated with the blood. And then his subsequent blows, swinging that weapon that is going to cast off that blood tangentially to the arc of the swing. And I'll show you a little graphic real quick to show you what I mean by tangentially to the arc, if you don't remember from geometry. 
and the pattern and intensity that we can see on the walls and the ceiling depend on what type of weapon they used. Um, so an experienced blood stain uh, expert can actually look at blood spatter and say, ah, oh, this was more of a baseball bat versus this was more of an axe, let's say. Uh, also, the amount of blood on the weapon obviously, obviously will change the blood spatter pattern. But here's one that you may not have thought about was the length of the arc. We can actually go back with some uh, software and look at the angles of impact of the blood spatter off this cast off and go back and track in what the arc of the swing would be to determine how long of, a, of an arc that is. And from there, we can figure out approximately the height of the person swinging that weapon. So it can be super useful in that um, kind of computer analysis. Uh, let me show you what I mean by tangentially to the arc of the swing. We're going to go ahead and murder Lincoln. Sorry, Lincoln. It's OK. He's already dead. Um, here's my hammer. And I'm going to swing it. And my first hit causes the bleeding. And then my second hit gets my weapon bloody. And so now that my weapon is bloody from my second hit, as I swing back, blood is going to come off on a tangent to the arc. And depending on the angle that it impacts the surface, is going to change the shape of the blood spatter. And they used to do this thing called stringing, where they would string out all of the blood spatter. They don't do that anymore. They actually do it with a computer now. And we'll talk about that next week. But you can see we have different angles of impact based on the shape. And in our activity this week, I will teach you how to do the uh, measurements and the math on that. I'm sure you're super excited about that. All right, next type of velocity is the medium velocity blood spatter. This is obviously faster, anywhere from more than five all the way up to 100 feet per second. Um, because you're going faster with the blood leaving the target, it needs now less weight in order to break free of the surface tension because we're adding in the force of movement. So we actually have less blood. It's not 0 0.05 mils of blood anymore. It's less than that. So you get a smaller spot. And usually, this kind of velocity comes from the actual blow of the weapon. So not the cast off as you swing it, but the actual impact of the weapon. Let's say hitting somebody with a baseball bat or a hammer or a wrench, or a cleaver. And so the blood spatter you're going to get from this is going to be smaller. It still can make a pattern on a wall that we still can do that same kind of analysis to see what the angle of impact is to figure out where the blood came from. Um, but the spots are going to be smaller because it's going faster. The last one is high velocity blood spatter. And this is obviously blood that's go moving really fast, over 100 feet per second. Um, now, because it's going so fast and there's so much of a force aspect to this, there needs to be very little blood to break away from the surface tension before it pulls away from the body. So you're going to get a very, very small amount of blood, which means you're going to get a very, a very fine mist and a really small diameter spot. And because it's so small, it doesn't have much weight, so it can't go very far. So high velocity blood spatter usually doesn't travel more than about a meter or about three feet away from when the target was hit. This is most common from gunshots, but it can be come from something else. It high speed machinery, let somebody say somebody's using high speed machinery and they get their hand ripped off in it or something like that, or a chainsaw, or um, it could even be a, a car impact if the car impact the car is going fast enough. Um, there's my chainsaw, uh, a wood chipper. If somebody was trying to dispose of a bo body in a wood chipper, that would be definitely high velocity blood spatter. But you do get these way, way, way smaller uh, droplets of blood because they don't have as much volume of blood in it because they were going so fast. Uh, I do want to give you one last piece of info before we stop, and that is in relation to gunshots. There's a couple special vocabulary words we use for gunshot. Uh, blood spatter and uh, it'll be illustrated with this uh, little graphic and that is uh, back spatter and forward spatter so we're going to use this foam as our victim here and we're our travel of our bullets going to go from left to right so as the bullet passes from the left to the right this blood that comes back 
at the shooter is called back spatter. The blood that goes out of the exit wound, if there is an exit wound, is called forward spatter because it's going forward with the bullet. So let me give you just, a, now that we know the terms, back is back at the shooter, forward is forward with the bullet. Let me give you a couple more facts about each one and then we're done. Um, here's a little actual picture of what that would look like going through a substance. This over here on the left would be the back spatter and this is the forward spatter. So back spatter um, comes from the entrance wound. It passes back towards the weapon and shooter. We usually only see this at close range. Um, for whatever reason, if somebody is shot from far away, they generally don't get any back spatter. Um, as a forensic scientist, we're going to be looking for this on the barrel, on the weapon, on the hand, arm, chest of the shooter. So if somebody uh, says, oh, I was defending myself and I shot them and they were across the room, but we see back spatter on them, then that clearly tells us they're lying because we know high velocity uh, blood spatter can only go about three feet. So, and oftentimes criminals will notice that they had blood on the gun and they'll wipe it off, but sometimes they won't check actually inside the barrel. So that's a, a place where forensic scientists often look. Um, and again, oftentimes it will be on the hand or arm or, or clothing of the person who is the shooter. For forward spatter, this is coming from an exit wound, but there are lots of gunshots that don't ever make an exit wound. The bullet gets lodged in, it hits a bone, it gets stuck in an organ, and it never leaves the body. So if there's no exit wound, there is no forward spatter. Uh, it does pass in the same direction as the shot, and there's always more of it. If there's forward spatter, you'll get more forward spatter than back spatter. That's what the word copious means. It just means there's more of it. Um, if we have an exit wound, we will have forward spatter no matter where, how far away the gunshot came from. Um, and generally we would see this on nearby surfaces or objects or people. This is the one they show in TVs all the, all the time. The two pictures I'm about to show you look gruesome, but they're both fake. They're both from movies, but they give you an idea what forward spatter it is. So here's somebody like they got shot and the blood spatters against the wall behind them. Uh, here's somebody else. Again, both fake pictures, don't freak out. So we've got a lot, 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 lot of information we can learn just from looking at the blood spatter at a crime scene. And they do employ uh, special forensic technicians, blood spatter experts that are uh, trained in how to look at it and how to analyze it and how to measure it and do the math involved in it. Uh, and the computer analysis in it in order to piece back what happened in the crime scene. In the very near future, you'll get an assignment for me that takes you through how we measure this and how we do the math to figure out what the angle of impact is. And then next week, we'll go into how we can actually piece this together into a broader spectrum for an entire crime. Thank you so much for watching, and I will talk to you next time.